All right, we're going to go ahead and get started today with the Psalm of David, the 145th Psalm. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. I will meditate on your glorious splendor, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies are over all his works. All your works shall praise you, O Lord, and your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power to make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord upholds all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look expectantly to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord and all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. Heavenly Father, glorious Heavenly Father, thank you for once again bringing us to this place of beauty, just adorned with your loving hand of grace, the trees that flow above us and the uh, wind that comes through them and uh, the little animals that scurry by and fly by as we uh, meet out here. Thank you for each one of them. Your, your glory is evident in all the things that you have done and you're a great and wonderful creator. And we want to uh, just praise you, give you the praise and the glory and the honor that you alone are due because everything has been ordained by you and everything is for you. And we want to give you praise and glory above all else for the gift of your son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for the work he did on our behalf, which we could never ever hope to have reconciliation without, but through him we can. And he is our mediator, he is our God, and we thank you for him and what he's done. Lord, we do praise you. All honor, all majesty, all praise, all glory, all of it is for you alone. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we say this, amen. All right, I've got a few, uh, just a few announcements today. Um, the first is uh, the building that we've bought is actually under work after 12 weeks of waiting for uh, permitting. Uh, a week ago, we got the back slab out and then nothing had been done after that. Uh, we got uh, this week some slab cut out of the inside where plumbing has to go. And then the plumbers came in and did the rough work on that. And uh, I expect a delay in the next week, though, because the meter has to be moved, and that's something that Sarasota County has to do. And so Sarasota County will come out and move the meter in their good timing, which means everything else will have to wait until that happens. But once that happens, then we can pour a slab, we can extend the building, and, and uh, things should move rather quickly after that because no more permitting is required. It's all done, and we just do one thing after another, have it inspected, after the inspection, move on to the next thing. So we're excited about that. That'll be, uh, some of you may not know it, but it's over in the Gulf Gate area. Very small building, but uh, uh, it's where the Lord has us and we're excited about it. So um, also uh, this today is our 78th Genesis sermon. Uh, we've uh, been going from Genesis 1-1 and we're up to Genesis 32 now. And uh, we probably have about another year in Genesis, but uh, the pictures that are being revealed are, are wonderful. Of, the things that are coming. And you'll see this again today in a very short eight verses. Um, also, uh, I am not going to do a New Testament reading today. I don't know how long I'm going to speak and I don't want to get too long. We've got a lot of people here and it's hot out. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, I, I will skip a New Testament reading. Normally we just do that a, a few verses and we just talk about them real quickly. There's nothing in depth. Um, but once we move into a building, we'll establish a Bible study two, three, four days a week and uh, uh, go from there. But um, anyway, today's sermon is Genesis 32, 1 through 8. It's called, This is God's Camp. And um, one other thing is that uh, we have a lot of water back behind us. We're fortunate to be blessed with that. 
And uh, if anybody's never been scripturally baptized and it's something they say, hey, I want to do that today, I do that any, any time that somebody asks. And uh, what it is is uh, baptism in Christianity eventually diverted away from the Bible and they started into infant baptism and different practices. Uh, but the Bible uh, always shows people being baptized after coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He did this for me and now I'm going to do something which pictures what he did for me. And that is to be buried with Christ uh, in his grave and then raised to newness of life through the power of the resurrection. And uh, so that, that is something that I offer anytime. And uh, so if you do want to be baptized, uh, just come and let me know and we'll go right on out there before I go home and uh, do the rest of the work I do on Sundays. And um, I think that's all of the announcements. I'll go ahead and read you one more psalm and then we'll, uh, we'll get into what we have to do. And we should be done in about an hour and 15 minutes for the people that are visiting, just so you know. Um, uh, it, it's usually about an hour and 15 minutes long, which includes communion as well. So uh, the 146th Psalm is, uh, says, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fathers and the widow but the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. So uh, uh, what I do, and there's quite a few people actually today that don't normally attend, and so uh, we uh, get into the sermon right away, but there's one thing I always do before we do the sermon, and it's one of my favorite things because it helps us take history and sometimes apply biblical precepts to it. Uh, I do this day in history. And uh, so today is 16 June, and today on uh, this day in 455 AD, Rome was sacked by the Vandal army. And uh, that was the second of three sacks that uh, Rome went through in its history. And uh, these people went in and they, uh, they destroyed buildings, they defaced things, they robbed, they pillaged. Uh, they did all kinds of things that uh, are contrary to uh, what is sound and reasonable, but they were an, an invading force. Uh, however, they took it to such an extreme that we now have a term based on what they did, and it's called vandalism. This is where the term vandalism comes from. And uh, in history, and especially in the English language, which weighs so heavily from the Greek and also from Hebrew, but uh, uh, from Latin, we have all kinds of words that uh, are developed out of things that occur. And uh, one of the things, for example, is if you've ever heard the term ostracized. Um, in Athens, uh, when they were a great empire, they uh, had a uh, policy that once a year, you would take and inscribe on a piece of broken pottery, which is called an ostraca, any name that you wished. And you would throw it into a jar and they would tally up all of the uh, names. And um, whoever had the most votes was kicked out of Athens. And uh, they were uh, exiled, sent into banishment. And uh, that was to keep the people, because it was a democracy, keep them, uh, you know, humble, not uh, being, uh, you know, over uh, prideful or whatever. And uh, as a lesson, one of the greatest uh, Greek uh, people in their history, a guy named Themistocles, uh, who actually saved Athens from a two million man Medo-Persian army under, I think it was Xerxes, uh, a couple of years later was ostracized. He was the one that was chosen because he said, you know, these people owe me now. And they didn't like that. They liked the fact that he had saved them entirely as a people, but out he went. So uh, ostracized, vandalism, all of these things are seen uh, in our words. But uh, vandalism came from the sacking of Rome in 455. Uh, then we come to, uh, gee, 1400 years later, big gap in history. We come to 1858 and in a speech in Springfield, Illinois, U.S. Senate candidate Abraham Lincoln, he was very young at this time, uh, said the slavery issue had to be resolved. He declared, oh, it's terrible. He actually quoted the Bible. He, uh, he said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Those are the words of Jesus himself, and uh, he was right. Uh, America was a divided house, just as Israel, as we'll see today, was a, div a, a divided land. 
and um, so a house divided cannot stand. He quoted that, and uh, now it's uh, it's to the point where we cannot have a Bible in a government office on your desk, even if you're a Christian. You can be excused from uh, your service as a, a military employee or a uh, government employee simply because you have a Bible. So uh, you know, quoting the Bible is always something that uh, is a sketchy at best for people uh, in today's society. And it's very sad because this is the foundation of our society. And uh, the Trinity decision of the uh, 1890s is still in effect today, which actually says this is a Christian nation. And uh, until that's overturned by the US Supreme Court, that is the law of the land. And so for somebody to stand up and say this is not a Christian nation is showing their ignorance in the uh, structure and uh, uh, form of our government. There's only two nations on the planet that have ever been established in a covenant with God. One was Israel from God to the people, and one was America from the people to God. And so uh, this is a Christian nation. And I'm unashamedly out here every week, even though we've had many times people come and challenge us. And uh, we will continue to do this until we move into our building is that uh, we actually had uh, employees of Sarasota County come and challenge us. And uh, my response is the same every time, call the police and we'll let them solve it. And they don't wanna do that. And so uh, the uh, county has to get involved and it always comes out on our side because we're within our legal right. But that was 1858, uh, Senate candidate Abraham Lincoln, a house divided cannot stand. 1897 on this day, 16 June, the US government signed a treaty of annexation with Hawaii. And uh, it, Hawaii is a beautiful state. My brother lived there. Um, I preached at the Capitol in Hawaii along with all the other 49 capitals in 2010. And I did it right in front of the statue of Kamehameha, and, um, which is right across from the, uh, the Capitol. And um, I, uh, actually, I did it at the Capitol, but I also did something at the statue of Kamehameha. Sorry about that. But um, uh, anyway, it's a beautiful place. And uh, the thing that I've never quite understood is how we have developed our states. We have 50 states, and uh, but we have many, many territories which we've annexed, Guam and Puerto Rico and uh, you know places out in the uh, South Pacific. And they are not states even to this day, even though they're protectorates. But for whatever reason, um, we did make uh, Hawaii a state and I'm glad about that. And uh, uh, if you've ever been there, you know what a beautiful place it is. And uh, uh, I hope someday to return. I got some friends that are visiting there right now. Um, let's see here, 1903. The Ford Motor Company was incorporated. And, uh, you know, wonderful cars they used to make. And uh, they are the one company that didn't take government handouts recently um, in uh, the uh, big government bailout. But um, uh, I, I just will say this I'm not a big fan of American cars anymore, just simply because of the way the labor unions have uh, uh, been promoted by the left. Uh, wing of the government. They funnel money into them and then they vote for them. And I think that's a wrong way to do that. Now, I'm not saying that doesn't happen in Japan or Korea, or wherever we get our other cars from, but that's their problem over there. And so until we get that resolved in the country, you know, Ford is a great standard in America and I hope that they succeed. Uh, but uh, they were actually incorporated in 1903. Uh, 1922, something really fun happened. A guy named Henry Berliner made the first helicopter flight at a place called College Park, Maryland. And uh, if you've ever seen a picture of him in this thing, it's a little rickety thing. And it's got these, these uh, instead of blades going like this, they really are like this. And I, you wonder how the thing didn't just fall apart. I mean, he was a brave man to get up there and do it, but he did it. And uh, you know, even today, helicopter flight is a little bit sketchy. If they lose their rotors, then it, it, it's more downward. Uh, it, you know, uh, gravity takes over much more than a plane with fixed wings, which can, you know, often, go with land without uh, power. But uh, anyway, Henry Berliner, he was a, a wise guy and a, a brave, brave person. 1925 on 16 June. I got a few things from Germany here in a row and I don't really care about anyone individually, but it kind of shows us a pattern and so that's why I included these. Um, France accepted a German proposal for a security pact. Uh, World War I was over in 1917 and now they're friends and they're getting along and they've got this pact between the two of them and they'll never invade each other again, they'll never harm each other again, sure enough. Um, but uh, something happened uh, about seven years later in 1932 on this day, uh, the ban on Nazi stormtroopers was lifted by the von Papen government. He was a predecessor of Albert, uh, uh, Adolf Hitler, he was just one of the, uh, the you know, whatever president or whatever you call it of the, uh, the German Republic. And uh, he lifted a ban that they had on Nazi stormtroopers. And so things are starting to change in the structure of Germany. And then eight years later in 1940, 
Marshal Henry Philippe Pertain became the prime minister of the Vichy government of occupied France. So you can see they have a security treaty. We're going to be friends forever. And within just a few short years, Germany has gone in. They've gone over the river. They've attacked and they've subdued France. And now they're a uh, once again an occupied nation. And it took many, many lives of Americans and British and other people to free the French. And uh, that's the way of the world is that we, we uh, have to watch our treaties and we have to watch and be faithful to them from our side. But we need to be careful not to be snookered by people that have made one with us that they're not, in fact, going to violate it. And uh, just the way of the world. And I thought I'd include those so you can see that things really uh, do change rather quickly. And you'll see that in the pages of the Bible as well. Treaties are made and treaties are broken. You've got a treaty with Israel, come and make a treaty with me. I'll give you more money than they did. And that's what happens. And so these things keep marching forward as God unveils the, uh, the plan of history that he has for us. Um, 1952, still in line with the German theme, but uh, something more uh, on our side. Anne Frank, Diary of a Young Girl, was published in the U.S. And um, if you know the writings of Anne Frank, they became a standard in American schools. Uh, you could choose that or Beowulf or Shakespeare or something and do a report on it. And um, I brought this one up because uh, just a couple weeks ago, somebody, I think it was Arizona, maybe California, um, uh, determined that uh, they were going to sue to have Anne Frank removed because uh, of the things that it says about her coming to a knowledge of her own sexuality. The most normal thing in the world and that a girl would write in her own diary and that we want to learn how people live in these occupied situations under oppressive rules and she wrote out of her heart and out of the life that she wasn't allowed to continue and now we want that taken out of school and I guarantee you that this person that did this suit is a pro-abortion person she's probably pro-homosexuality she's probably pro everything except what is morally right and just and my guess is that this comes from anti-semitism and it does not come from uh, a love of humanity and of morality so uh, there you go. That happened on this day in 1952. And then 1955, Pope Pius XII excommunicated Argentine President Juan Perón. And uh, the ban was lifted eight years later. Then I brought this one up specifically because, um, you know, I am not anti-Catholic. I've got a lot of good Catholic friends and they attend Catholic churches that proclaim Jesus Christ. But there is, in any denomination or any church, if you have a hierarchy, there are going to be, be people that set precedences which are wrong. And uh, the Catholic Church has got wrong precedences in many ways. And one of them, for example, is annulment. The Bible does not allow divorce. It is anti-biblical. Now, if you get a divorce, you can be forgiven of that. There's no doubt about it. Jesus Christ came to redeem us from our sins. But uh, it does not allow me as a pastor to say, yes, I think you can get a divorce because your husband is beating you. That's not in the Bible. Unless he's sexually immoral and commits adultery, you cannot leave him. He can leave you if he is a non-believer. But other than that, those are the only two premises in the Bible. So you can get counseling. Nothing says I can't tell somebody they can't get separated, but divorce is not authorized. But the, the uh, papacy comes up with things like annulment. This marriage with 15 children never happened. And what is that? That is the thing that Jesus rebuked the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees the most over. Adding to the word of God, introducing the doctrines of men above the word of God. And that's something that we will all be held accountable to, not just in the Old Testament, not just under the law as Jesus spoke, but also in the book of Revelation, chapters uh, one, two, and three, to the, the letters to the churches. He asks us to toe the line and to be morally pure and to be uh, uh, up, up, morally upright in our dealings with others, and especially with him and with the word that he's given us and to cherish it and to tremble at it and not to treat it flippantly. But uh, anyway, that, uh, I brought that in for that reason. And uh, on this same day in 1955, in the same country, the Argentine naval officers uh, brought a coup against the president, Juan Perón. And uh, he was uh, defended by the army. The Navy tried to have a coup. The army defended him. The army won. And that was the expense of about 300 and some people. And uh, I always bring these things up. And uh, if you've been here more than a couple uh, church on the beaches, you know the reason why I bring it up is because not one of those 350 people got up in the morning and said, I'm going to die today. Not one of them. They all thought, you know, life's going to go on and or I'm going to win this coup or I'm going to, you know, whatever. Uh, some of them were just in buildings that got bombed. And we do not know our last breath. We do not know when we are going to meet our creator. And I assure you, every person here is going to meet the creator. 
And if you believe in what the Bible says, there are only one of two places you're going to go. And Jesus Christ has came to resolve that problem for us. And I'll talk about that before we finish today, as to how to be right with your Creator. It'll only take a minute or two, but it's something I want to do because you may get into your car and pull out on the midnight pass and have uh, somebody from Ohio run into you and kill you because they don't know the roads. I say that because we got some people from Ohio here today. But uh, uh, in all seriousness, you don't know when you're going to die. And uh, so the Bible tells us today is the day of God's favor. Now is the time of salvation. Be right with Christ before that last moment. And 300 and some people, whether they were right with him or not, their life ended that day. So please evaluate who you are as a human being in your relationship to your creator. Um, another one, 1971, and this goes into the, the Catholic theme as well. Um, El Greco sketch, The Immaculate Conception, was recovered in New York City by the FBI, and it had been uh, stolen about 35 years earlier. And the reason why I bring this up is not because I uh, am a fan of El Greco, although his work is okay. Um, it's because I wanted to ask, does anybody know what Immaculate Conception deals with? The what? No, everybody thinks that. Everybody thinks that it deals with Jesus. It has nothing to do with Jesus at all. It is a doctrine which actually is opposed to Jesus. It, it is opposed to the Bible. The Immaculate Conception says that Mary was born sinless. And we know from the Bible, it's very clear that sin travels through the male. That's the reason for the rite of circumcision. It's a picture of cutting away the sin. Jesus Christ was incarnate in a woman's womb, God the Father and a human being. And so he is the God man, but he did not inherit Adam's sin because he came through a woman, but not through a man. Mary came through a male and a female, and therefore she had to inherit Adam's sin. Okay? If that's not the case, as they claim, then that means God could do that for anybody. And we wouldn't have the problem that we have right now. And it also sets up a false dilemma for each one of us because now do we pray to Mary, who's sinless? She is, according to the Catholics, a co-mediatrix. She is our mediator. When the Bible says that there's one mediator between God and man, it is the man Christ Jesus. She is not a co-mediatrix. And there is a, a branch of Catholicism that actually has her as a co-redeemer. Although she didn't die on a cross and she didn't shed any blood for us, uh, she uh, can redeem us. Well, that's, that is absolute blasphemy. That's 100% blasphemy, as is the Immaculate Conception, if the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, another thing that they hold on to with Mary is uh, the um, perpetual virginity of her. Well, the Bible says that uh, Mary had other sons and daughters. So I don't know how she could be a perpetual virgin, especially, you know, it says with Joseph, he did not know her until after the child was born, implying that he knew her after Jesus was born. And therefore, this is why we need to have our doctrine straight in our head. Is the Bible the word of God or is it not? Then you all have to evaluate that yourself. I can't put that into you, but I would ask each person to search these principles out because they are important. They're hugely important and they make all the difference in the world as to whether you are pursuing God or whether you are pursuing something which is against God. The Bible says, fix your eyes on Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, Hebrews 3, chapter, uh, verse 1. And uh, this is, it never says, look at Mary. And as a matter of fact, her role is diminished in the Bible other than to be the mother of the Son of God. And so she's blessed because of that. But after uh, Acts chapter 1, when they all meet, it mentions her one more time. She's never mentioned again. So please hold fast to the doctrine of the Bible and uh, search these things out. And if you have any questions about these things, my email is always open. That's all I do all day long is email people answering Bible questions and why things are the way they are. And I try not to be belligerent about it. You know, some people like to be antagonistic and so you finally get to the point where it's not worth it. But uh, I, I do try to keep my email open for these type of things. Um, 1978, Carter and Panama leader. I, Carter is my second least favorite uh, president of our uh, history. He, uh, he and Panama leader Torrijos ratified the Panama Canal Treaties. And uh, he gave away what many Americans worked very hard for. It's something France was defeated at, and we moved in, and we did it. Something that they thought couldn't be done. There was malaria, there was dysentery, there was all kinds of uh, uh, trials and troubles, and yet the, the great power came down from the north, and we did this. And it was our land, we owned that land, as a part of uh, what was done, and uh, it, we received the benefits from it. And now we have to pay to go through what we built. And uh, I, I just think that that was a bad mistake by Carter. You know, we could have given them equal rights or, you know, but to just sign away something 
did not show good faith to the American people that put their lives uh, to the challenge and so many who died. Anyway, um, 1980, please don't get angry at this one. I, I've never seen this movie uh, except on TV, which means if there are bad words, they're edited out. But the reason why I included this one is because it has more car crashes than any other movie probably ever filmed. And I love car crashes and car chases. And uh, it was just an exciting, exciting movie to watch. So please don't get angry when I said that the Blues Brothers opened in Chicago, Illinois on this day, 16 June in 1980. Yes, uh, what's his name? Uh, Elrod and uh, help me out somebody. I remembered it this morning and uh, Jake, Jake and Elrod. Uh, they, they, uh, they, they were the Blues Brothers. And yes, they were on a mission from God and all that stuff. No, that's not the way it works. It was just a fun movie on TV. Like I say, if there's bad words in there, I apologize for bringing up a movie if it has a lot of you know, profanity in it. But it was fun to watch those car wrecks. Thousands of them. I mean, just the police by the, by the gross were going into destruction. So anyway, finally in 2008 something, which is just to me as upsetting as anything that has happened in our nation and continues to be perpetrated on us, is that um, California began issuing marriage licenses to same-sex couples. And uh, Romans 1, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven because of these type of things. And people will receive the due penalty of their perversion. I am not anti-gay as an individual human being. I am anti-gay because God is anti-gay. God came to redeem us from these things, not to tolerate those type of things. And there is a big difference between the two. And we have to either obey God or not obey God. And our nation has fallen so far from its moral base that I do not think that we will recover without a large, large cataclysm, whether it'll be a war, whether it'll be uh, you know, a financial ruin, uh, something along the lines of Israel. If you wanna know what is coming, and which makes me cry when I read it, read the book of Lamentations, that God is holy, that he does judge his people. The children really do die in famine. It, it's very sad, but these are the consequences of our decisions. So this is something that we, we have to evaluate in our own lives. And uh, am I going to support this or am I not going to support this? And uh, enough feeling bad now. I may have a couple little points in the, the sermon that uh, might make you feel down. But the rest of it from here on out, as I was explaining to a couple people, we evaluate uh, the Bible and we uh, apply it to our lives. I do not do life application sermons. I do Bible application sermons so that when you are done with a Bible study or, or a sermon, you know how to take that and apply it to your life rather than applying your life to what you know somebody says in a sermon. And uh, it lasts you for a day or two and then you're back into your same neuroses. I would hope that you would read this glorious gift of God all the days of your life when you wake up and when you go to bed and throughout the day meditate on it as he asks you and it will lead you through every possible thing that you could think of everything if you are thinking about a divorce it'll tell you what not to do but it will also tell you how to handle it in the process if you're thinking about you know giving up an addiction it will tell you the right way to do it. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need counselors and doctors to help you through certain things in life. I'm saying that this is the guidebook because it was written by the guide. And this is what will lead us to that higher rock and to that place which shows us the face of God in Jesus Christ. So here we go. Um, I'll read you the text, which is Genesis 32, verses 1 through 8. And uh, wonderful stuff. As always now, I want you to understand this before I get into this for those that have never been here. If you do not understand what we have been doing and what the pictures represent, then it will be more difficult, but it will be explained as we go. So don't think, what's he talking about? I will explain each precept, but certain things throughout the book of Genesis continually represent the same things again and again. God is trying to lead us to an understanding of what's going on in the rest of history. That's why this is Genesis. It's the book of foundations. I'm going to do something in the world in these pictures, which they're just obscure stories. Why would he include this? It's to show us what will happen. And um, uh, today, as I'm reading these eight verses, try to process what you know from the past sermons, or if you haven't seen these, just try to think, why would God include this? Here we go, just eight verses. Uh, verse uh, one, so Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them saying, speak thus to my Lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. 
and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. Then the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We also came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you. And four hundred men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. And he said, If Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. Okay, in today's very short story, we're going to see a brief overview of the nation of Israel and how it divided into two separate kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The wisdom of this occurrence was directed by God for the sake of protecting his people as they would lead to the Messiah. We have a text verse for today that comes from the 14th Psalm. Oh, that salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Now we're gonna review the verses today where Jacob's time of exile is ending and he's heading back to the land of promise. And on his way there, his time and the events which occurred will be used as a picture of the future of the people of Israel and the world which is a threat to them. We'll also see the divine protection of this group of people which continues to be realized, believe it or not, to the present time. And for almost 4,000 years since the time of Jacob, they have endured and they have been kept. God is faithfully amazing faithfully, amazingly faithful to his people. And so, may God speak to us through his word today and may his glorious name ever be praised. I have uh, three individual thoughts for you today. The first is the two camps. This is verse one. So Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. Laban departed from Jacob. That happened a week ago. They had a little altercation and we saw what that picture and off Laban is going now and he's heading back to Padan Aram. Now that he's gone, Jacob is continuing his journey towards the land of Canaan. He's not there yet. While on the way, it says the angels of God met him. The English word for angels comes from the Greek word agalos. It signifies a messenger. In Hebrew, the word is malach, which comes from the root word laach, which carries the exact same concept as the Greek, to send, to minister, or to employ. And so throughout the Bible, we find it used to identify both heavenly beings and people. And that's important to understand that it encompasses more than just, you know, spirits flying around us. Prophets and priests and spirits have all been described by this word as we're going to see. And it's translated in the English as the word language or angels. Therefore, it is more suited to the nature of the office rather than the nature of the being. Now, when Jacob left Canaan 20 years earlier, the last thing which was recorded before he left the land. It was in Bethel, he had a vision of ladders with angels ascending and descending on it. Now that he's returning to the land, he has another vision of angels. The understanding that we can get from this, this sighting is that they have been there all along, but he simply just didn't know it. And this is completely in line with a host of other uh, verses which are found throughout the Bible, such as in the 34th Psalm. It says there, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. And he camped all around Jacob for 20 years and he has delivered them, him and all of his company with him. The angels have been with him, they've kept him, and we know it so because of the Lord's promised protection at the time of that vision, which was recorded back in Genesis 28, if you remember what he said there. Behold, I am with you. This is the Lord speaking from the top of the ladder down to Jacob. And I will keep you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. True to his promise, he's been with Jacob, he's kept him and is now returning him to the land of promise. In this, we see the words of the 91st Psalm perfectly fulfilled. It says, therefore, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in your, all your ways. Now that's speaking of Jesus ultimately as the Messiah, but Jacob is picturing Jesus in these sermons and he's doing the same thing for Jacob. The Lord gave his angels charge over Jacob and they've certainly kept him in all his ways. Matthew Henry says that when God designs uh, his people for extraordinary trials, he prepares them by extraordinary comforts. And I'll give you a perfect life application of that right now. God has all of us set for trials. 
I am not Joel Olstein, and I'm not going to tell you that the week ahead is going to be one of blessing and prosperity and abundance. That may happen, and I pray it does for you. But at the same time, I want you to know that bad things happen to good people. And we suffer, and we lose people in our families, and we have puppies that die, and heartaches, and we have trials, and financial troubles, and sickness, and every other thing. And in the process of getting us ready for those extraordinary trials, he gives us his extraordinary comfort, and that is his word. He has left this gift, this treasure with us, to lead us to better places during those trials, and to uplift our soul during the time when we're in good shape so that we're on an even higher plane as we're ever approaching the altar and uh, the glory of the temple. This is what he's done by giving us his word. And in his word, he gives us a promise of one particular thing, divine angelic protection. And uh, it's a life lesson that we need to remember and it's one that we can hold on to. In the New Testament book of Hebrews, in fact, in the first chapter of Hebrews, it says this in the 14th verse, are they not all, meaning angels, ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Now, what does that mean? That means that if you are a saved believer in Jesus Christ, right now you have angels that are ministering to you. They are tending to you and you may have a trial, but they will be with you during that trial. And it also means that the unsaved, if God knows that they will someday call on him, are being ministered to by angels as well. That's what that implies. Anybody who will inherit salvation is given this grace of God, which is angelic protection. If you've ever heard of some miraculous deliverance from an accident or a trial, like I know somebody that was in a van, they were coming back from a mission trip, and somebody cut them off a, a, a semi, and they ended up flipping around and around and around and around, and not one of them had a bruise on them. And she said, well, we were delivered by angels, and I do believe that. I believe that they could have been angelically protected. God was looking over them for whatever his reasons are. There's no reason to think that it didn't come about as the divine intervention of angels. God, as I said, he's gonna call all of us home in his own good timing. But in the interim, his angels are carefully tending to those who will in fact inherit salvation. So stand firm on that. The word says it, if this word is true, then it is true as well. And so when you're going through that terrible trial, somebody lying there with cancer, or maybe you lying there with cancer in the hospital, there's an angel that is ministering to you. And the ultimate goal is that we, this is a fallen world, and we are going to a better place. And that is the comfort above all of these trials that we face, is the promise of what God has for us when he restores all things, and when he brings us back to the way it should have been in the Garden of Eden. We come to our second verse. When Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And he called the play, name of that place Mahanaim. Now, when you listen to Hebrew, you'll hear words that end in I am, Ephraim or Mahanaim. That is a plural marker. It's like our S on the end of a word. So it, he is saying he called the name of that place camps or two camps. All right, that's just something for you to understand. Jacob sees these angels. He knows he's protected and he declares Mahane Elohim Ze. This is God's camp. But he said Mahane, which is singular. So what he's doing is he's saying, if he named the place Mahanaim, then he's talking about two camps, God's camp and his camp. What's rather amazing is that before he left 20 years earlier, when he woke up from his sleep in the vision of the ladder, he said, surely this is God's house. So these are bookends on his time away from Canaan, the house and the camp. The difference between a house and a camp is that a house is permanent and it's fixed, but a camp is movable and it's changing. The house of God is heaven, his permanent dwelling, but the camp of God is where his presence is displayed and revealed among men. It is where his angels congregate to serve his purposes. Okay, I got something from the book of uh, Joel, chapter two. It shows us the display of God's presence from his camp. It says there, the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now on Jacob's return home, he sees the camp of God and he says, this is God's camp. His pronouncements on the house of God and the camp of God are these bookends of his 20 years of exile. There is Bethel at the beginning and there is Mahanaim at the end. Like so many other places and names which are come, they, they're derived from a spoken word, 
Jacob names this place based on what he just said. He said, Mahane Elohim Zeh, this is God's camp. And now he's saying our camps, plural, are Mahanaim. And so it becomes the name of the location. Now Mahanaim is mentioned 13 times in the Bible, all of them in the Old Testament. And so for a very short period of two years, believe it or not, Mahanaim actually became the capital of Israel at the same time that David was ruling down in Hebron. We see this in 2 Samuel chapter 2. And you may not even know this, that there were actually two kingdoms at the time of David for a very short period. Here's what it says. But Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of Saul's army. Now remember, Saul was the first king of Israel. He died in battle. So the commander of the army uh, took Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. And he made him king over Gilead, over the Asherites, over Jezreel, over Ephraim, over Benjamin, and over all Israel. So now to help you remember the name of this place, and I want you to remember the name of this place because you're gonna see it again in the Bible and it's an important name to remember. I want you to understand where the name of Mahanaim is derived from. It comes from a verb, hana, mahanaim, hana, okay? And that means to bend down or to settle. This word is used in Judges chapter 9, 19, verse 9, to describe the ending of the day, the evening, okay? As a camp settles down, so does the setting of the sun. So you can see the comparison there. Now, to give you a mental picture of this, a derivative of the word hana is the word hanit, which means spear. So you say, Charlie, what does a spear have to do with settling? What does a spear do? You take it and you throw it. It goes up into the air, it arcs, and then it comes back down, like the shape of a tent or the setting of the sun. So you have Mahanaim, you have Hana, and you have Hanit. Try to remember those a little squiggle for your brain so that you can remember that in the future. Why is God showing us these things? Jacob sees the camp of God and the tents next to his, and he calls the place two camps, Mahanaim, the plural. There is his camp and there is God's camp camps. Again, as we've seen in the past, and this is consistent all the way through the Bible, the number two signifies that which contrasts and yet that which confirms, such as there are two testaments in the Bible. You have the Old Testament and the New, law and grace. They contrast each other and yet they confirm the word of God. The second person of the Trinity is Jesus. He is the God-man. They contrast and yet they confirm that he is our incarnate word, Jesus. All right? They contrast and yet they confirm. You also have, for example, the two witnesses in the book of Revelation. One is a Jew, one is a Gentile. They contrast, but they confirm the word of God to the people of the world, all right? In this case, there is a contrast between these two camps. One is physical, one is spiritual, one is earthly, one is divine, one is mortal, one is eternal. They contrast and yet they confirm. They are the two camps of God's dealings, all right? They are God's tools in his plan of redemption. And so here you see the importance of Israel. For people that believe that the church replaced Israel, you can see very clearly that that cannot be the, the case because these two camps confirm what God is doing in human history. If he were to destroy Israel, the plan would not be correct, just as the two testaments of the Bible. You take one out and it is no longer God's plan. Israel is a very important entity and it has a very important purpose in the years ahead. This is not only the only time that these camps are going to be seen too. This is very interesting to me. Both in the Bible and in recorded history they are noted. In the Bible God's angelic protection is seen for example in 2 Kings chapter 6. Now if you know the story you've got the king of Syria and he sends these war parties down into Israel and they keep getting defeated. They go on on these uh, subversive attacks and for some reason somebody keeps defeating them. And so the king of uh, Syria says, who in my, my room here is telling the Israelites what's going on? Basically, who's the traitor here? Because they know we're coming, there must be a traitor. And they said, you don't understand. There is a prophet of God in Israel who knows what you do in your very room. He says, he's the one that is telling these people to do. And so that's where we start. It says here, so he said, go and see where he is. Now this is the king of, of Assyria saying, go and see where this prophet is that I may send and get him. Well, if he knows what he's doing as far as raids, then he's gonna know what he's doing as far as coming and retrieving him too. So the premise right there shows uh, uh, no logic at all, but it, that's 
how it is in depraved humanity is we think we're going to somehow get around God this time. So he's saying, go and uh, send that I may get him. And it was told him, saying, surely he is in Dothan. Now, just so you know, there's a Dothan in Alabama. And the only reason why I bring that up is because it was the very last place that I stopped at before I finished my 50 uh, uh, state trip and then came back to Florida. And Dothan, Alabama has some really beautiful people in it. If you ever want to go to a place that is just wonderful, go to Dothan, Alabama. Anyway, uh, we'll continue on. Verse 14, therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha prayed to the Lord and said, Strike this people, I pray, with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now remember who Elisha just prayed to. He prayed to the Lord. I'm going to bring that up again in a few minutes. Extra biblically, outside of the Bible, in A.D. 70, at the destruction of the temple, the Jewish people had rejected Jesus. They had nailed him to a cross, and they continued to re reject him after he was resurrected. Okay? And so punishment came on them. This is... Uh, Flavius Josephus wrote this account for us. At this time, the angels of God departed from Jerusalem. Here's what it says. A few days after that feast, on the 1 and 20th day of the month Artemisius, which is the month ER, a certain prodigious and incredible phenomena appeared. I suppose that the account of it would seem to be a fable, were it not related by those who saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals, for before the sun setting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running among the clouds and surroundings of the cities. Moreover, at that feast, which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that they heard a sound as of a great multitude saying, let us remove Hence, the angels of God departed. Israel rejected their Lord, and for their disobedience, the curses of Deuteronomy 28 came on them for their second time in their history. And the camp of God and all of the angels of God departed hence. However, I got to tell you something, numerous accounts, and way too numerous to be by, you know, people just making this up. Numerous accounts of Israel's renewed protection have been given over the past 50 years. I'm going to read you one of them right now. This happened, it says, during the Yom Kippur War. If you know when that was, Yom Kippur is the High Holy Day of Israel. It's the most sacred day that they observe to this day, although they don't observe it properly because Jesus fulfilled it. But uh, they are still uh, clinging to the law, and they have their High Holy Day. And the Arabs came against them en masse. It was uh, uh, 1973, and it says there, during the Yom Kippur War, a lone Israeli soldier in the Sinai led a captured Israeli column back to Israeli lines. When the Egyptian officer who was asked why he surrendered an entire tank column to a single Israeli soldier, the Egyptian officer replied, one soldier? There were thousands of them. The officer said that the soldiers had simply melted away as they approached the Israeli lines. The Israeli soldier reported that he was alone when the Egyptian commander surrendered to him. He didn't see any of the army of angelic warriors. That account comes from angels in the battlefield. This account, though, reflects perfectly the words of the psalm, the 68th psalm. Listen to these words where he's speaking about Sinai, where that battle took place. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, the holy place. Once again, and I assure you this is true, God's camp is surrounding his people as they are being prepared for the return of Jesus Christ and the establishment of his millennial reign. This is really great stuff here, and it echoes the words of today's verses. Now, before we go on, I want to give you just a little bit of instruction on angels. And I want to do this because people all around the world, and Christians especially, it seems, far too often misuse the intent and the purpose of angels. As noted in the book of Hebrews, angels are ministering spirits of God. They are not self-determining agents. In the Bible, they do what they are appointed to do, not what they want to do. 
Therefore, praying to angels or relying on them to help us make decisions is completely misguided. God gives us as human beings all manners of help. We don't need angels for this purpose. He gives us his word to guide us. He gives us brains to think with if we are willing to use them, all right? He gives us food to keep us going throughout the day. He gives us the sun to shine on the day so we can go out and work. And he gives us angels to minister to us as he directs. Our devotion, our attention, and our prayers are to be directed to God alone and never, never towards angels. And to help us understand this <laughs> is the premise which we will find in the very next sermon that I do next week when Jacob makes his great prayer to God. He doesn't do it to the angels that he saw just a moment ago. Pay attention to how Jacob acts in those particular verses and you will see this. What he does is right and it's in line with the account in Two Kings, which I just read to you, where Elisha prayed to the Lord and he didn't pray to the whole host of angels. All right, it is the Lord who directs the angels, <laughs> not Elisha, not us, and not the angels themselves, okay? Our second thought today, the messenger's message. <laughs> Verse three, then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother in the land of Seir, in the country of Edom. We have four names in this one particular verse, and they're all very important. The word used here, though, for Jacob's uh, messengers is the word malachim. Remember I told you, I am is plural, and we had the word malach, which means angel, so they are angels. He's sending his servants, and that's why I say that people are used in this capacity as well. They're malachim. His servants are being sent at his direction, just as God's angels are sent by God's direction. He had sent these guys earlier to go and tell his brother that he was coming, all right? So here in this verse, we return to a concept that we saw many, many sermons ago where Esau pitched, pictured fallen man. I wanna read you the verse again and remember those sermons. And if you didn't hear them, I will explain them. Then Jacob, picturing Jesus, sent messengers before <laughs> him to Esau, his brother in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, okay? Esau's name is linked to the word Asa, which in Genesis chapter one, that is the word used when uh, he made man. There's a word for create, which is bara, that's the creation. But he uses the word Asa when he made man. It's very similar to the word Esau. It is the word that is used to describe making him from the dust. Edom, his other name, is linked to the word Adam. Okay, so you have Esau and Asa, Edom and Adam and they're spelled the same way, they're very similar in pronunciation, and God is tying this together so that we understand this picture. Adam was made from the red soil of the earth, and that's where the name Edom comes from, red, okay? So the connection is made there. And then God includes another name in this verse, which is the name of the land, Seir, which means hairy. Well, why would a land be named Harry? Because it was named after Esau when he moved there. Now, if you missed the sermons on Esau, it would be good to go back and watch those sermons so you can understand what's going on. But let me wait for just a second while he goes overhead. Happens all the time. Sometimes we have five helicopters in a row go over us. So. Anyway, Esau was born Harry, if you remember that. He was like a garment, it says. It was as if he was born a fully developed man. And that's the picture that we're to get with Esau because man was made fully developed out of the dust of the earth. And that's why he was called Esau is because he was made from the womb like a man. That's what's going on. He pictures Adam made as a whole man. He was born with a, uh, a disease, we'll call it, or an affliction called hypertrichosis. Hypertrichosis means you have hair grow all over your body, like the famous werewolf woman at the, uh, the fair or whatever, mm -hmm. all right? Well, who is it that fashions man in the womb? According to the Bible, you fashioned me in the womb, God did. So God gave him this affliction so that he could make a picture of this man of what he's going to do in history. Esau is hairy. He comes from the land of hairy, the land Seir. And if you remember from those sermons, hair in the Bible denotes an awareness of things, an awareness of what's going on around you. The word uh, signifies this. It is tied directly to Esau's hairy body. And this is, means that he is a cognizant, sentient being, just as Adam was the moment that he was created. This is all explained in detail in those sermons. And we should try our best to remember these things as we move along, because God is including all of these names and places to show us pictures of what is happening and what is going to happen in world history. These messengers, the Malachim, that Jacob is sending out, 
are the prophets of Israel. That's what they're picturing. Those who send out the word to the people of the world, which is pictured by Esau. So he's sending messengers to Esau, just as the God is sending prophets to the people of the world. If you see this picture, which is going on, and I hope you're seeing these comparisons because this is what God is trying to illuminate us to. Verse four, and he commanded them saying, speak thus to my Lord Esau. Thus your servant Jacob says, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. The messengers of Jacob are commanded to speak to Esau using the term Adoni, which means my Lord. If you know your Hebrew, Adonai is my Lord speaking of God. Adoni is my Lord speaking of a human being. Despite having both the birthright and the blessing, he is deferring the honor to Esau, his older brother. He's actually calling himself as well, your servant. It's the same term that Isaac used to explain to Esau that he had been made Jacob's servant way back in Genesis 27. Here's what it said. Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I have made him your master and all his brethren I have given to him as servants. Jacob here, and don't miss this point, he's subordinating himself in order to gain Esau's favor. And hopefully he'll temper any anger that he has as well. And he will try to restore a right relationship between the two of them. You see anything that's going on here? The picture of somebody else maybe? Jacob probably already has an idea about how Esau feels because he knows where Esau is living, but Esau isn't living where he was living when he left 20 years earlier. In other words, he's probably been in communication with his brother throughout the years. But any letters or any messages may not tell the truth of Jacob's uh, real status in Esau's eyes. And so he's being very prudent in his dealings with his estranged brother. What this verse is picturing is as clear as it could be. If Esau is picturing fallen humanity and Jacob is picturing Jesus, then the messengers that Jacob sends before his arrival picture the prophets who have proclaimed the message of Jesus coming. Your servant is coming. Time and time again, that thought is seen all the way through the Old Testament prophets. One who would be the king of Israel, the Messiah of the world, and yet a servant to the world's people. A servant, remember he's saying, your master and your servant, and he's calling Adonai. This servant is coming. It's as clear as crystal. Isaiah says this in uh, his writings. He says, and now the Lord says, who formed me, speaking of Jesus, from the womb to be his servant to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. This is the Messiah of the whole world, Jew and Gentile. And the word he uses there when he says, my salvation is the word Yeshuati. The T is simply a possessive, like mine, Yeshua, Jesus. He says that you should be my Jesus to the ends of the earth. Even the Old Testament, if you just look, Jesus is everywhere. It's all saying he is coming and that's what these prophets are doing, which are pictured by Jacob sending these people to Esau, fallen Adam. Finally, in this verse, we have Jacob reminds Esau that he has been gone and he's lived with Laban 20 years, but now he's returning home. And what's he been doing while he was up there in Padan Aram? He's been building his flocks. And we saw that those flocks pictured the church. During the time of Israel's exile, a flock is being built. And if you remember the sermon about the peeled rods and the watering trough, he peeled them and showed the white. Those pictured Paul's writings to the Gentile people of the world. It was as clear as could be. So he's been gone these 20 years and the number 20 is specific. And I've explained this before, but I'm gonna do it again so the squiggle I gave you remains on your brain. Number 20 is one short of 21. 21 is the threefold seven. Three always indicates in the Bible divine completion, such as the uh, Trinity. It's divinely complete in uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Seven is the number of spiritual perfection. Most people know that. So 21 is the number of divine completion <laughs> of spiritual perfection. Because 20 is one short of 21, it indicates divine expectancy. And if you remember, I gave you many examples from the Bible that showed the divine expectancy of the number 20. Some sermons ago, this number 20 
was shown to, that it indicates or represents the full time of Israel's waiting to go from their establishment as a people all the way through to the time of the kingdom age, which is future to us now. It is the time of divine spiritual perfection. Jacob has established a people and he has a family who will become the tribes of Israel and he has his flock, which is the church. And he's heading back to the land of Canaan to continue his journey of expectancy there. And so he continues, verse five, I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, and male and female servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find favor in your sight. This verse shows that he obtained great wealth while he was away. He's not gonna be any burden on his brother Esau, but it's also here to keep Esau from feeling any threat, all right? Esau would know of the large camp that's heading out, that's coming back from Padan Aram, and Esau may actually think that it's Jacob that's coming to wipe him out. So to make sure that this doesn't happen, he again calls him Lord. He says, Adoni. He's showing that despite all of the wealth that he has, he is subjecting himself to his brother Esau. He will be no threat to him. Instead, he's looking to find favor in his sight. And we can see the same thought reflected in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 10. It says there, if the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post for conciliation pacifies great offenses. Matthew Henry notes it this way. He says, it is no disparagement to those that have the better cause to become petitioners for reconciliation and to sue for peace as well as right. Little life application for you. Guess what? That's what Jesus did. He had the far better cause from fallen man. And yet he is the one that humbled himself, left heaven's throne and came down and became a servant to the people of the world. He had the better cause and yet he is the one that sued for reconciliation. And he gives us that example as well. He asks us to humble ourselves and be the ones to sue for reconciliation. And I am not talking about people that are morally perverse and are antagonistic in their nature. We are to call sin, sin, and we are to call sin out. I'm talking about the people of the world that are just as the term is used, sheeple, dumb sheep people. And they're out there by the billions and we have to be the one that sues for reconciliation with them. I do mission work every Saturday morning of my life down in the projects. And yesterday, one of the girls that uh, comes with us from time to time gave us a hug and a kiss at lunchtime and she is leaving the rest of her life. She is going overseas to a Muslim nation to sue for peace with them in the name of Jesus. And she wept and we all were very sad to see her go and we're all so proud of her. And we don't know what's gonna happen to her in her life, but I can assure you that she will have ministering angels tending to her and the Lord will guide her and he will do great things for her even if it means dying over there. She will be honored by the Lord for her faithful service and this is what God asks us to do and this is what Jacob is doing. He is the one with the better cause. He has the birthright and the blessing and yet he is suing for reconciliation and I'll miss Jody. I'll miss her a lot but I am hugely happy that she's doing this. She's been a missionary before and the fire was so strong in her when she came back, she couldn't sit still. She's out there every, every week with us that she could be and she's training to go out in the field again. And this time, I don't think she'll be back. She's gonna spend the rest of her life doing this because that's the heart this woman has. I wish more men were like her. 90% of all the missionaries that go out nowadays are women. And we men fail at that. And it causes a dilemma because women are not to be preachers. They establish a church and then they, there's nobody there to run the church once they do that. Men need to step up and take care of these things and we way too often fail. Our third uh, thought today, Esau's response, verse six. Then the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is also coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. It's been 20 years since Jacob left and in that time Esau has become a prominent chieftain. There's no doubt about it. All of the people that he's with look to him. He married two wives of the Hittites, and then if you remember, he married a daughter of Ishmael as well. And he had consolidated his power among them. And this is evident by the large force that he's bringing along. Now it's debated, and scholars love to debate these things. It's debated, why is he bringing all of these people along with him? Some scholars say that he is coming up there to avenge himself on his brother and to wipe him out. Others feel that he is going to defend himself from Jacob if necessary. And finally, other people are sure that he's simply going up there to honor his brother. Okay, I've thought it through and I'll give you the correct answer. That, that's a joke. I'm, I want you all always to think through what I say because I could be wrong as well. But what I think it is, is that 
because he is bringing along 400 people, it's probable that he wanted to give a negative impression, but ultimately he wanted to honor him. Otherwise, he would have either told him he was coming on friendly terms and not put him through the distress, or he would have simply carried through with his unfriendly terms. And so I believe that's what's going on here. No matter though what Esau is thinking, Jacob is going to take it in a negative context as we're gonna see in the next verse. And regardless of this, regardless of whatever he's thinking, the number 400 is given and it is specific. It's very precise. God could have simply said, as he does many times in the Bible, that somebody is coming with a large army, okay? He doesn't do that this time. He gives a very specific number, 400 is given, okay? Therefore, he wants us to explore why this number is used. The number 400 is the product of two lesser numbers, okay? Eight and 50. Eight is the Hebrew word, and this is my favorite word in all of the Hebrew language, and you're gonna laugh when I say why, but it's the number, it's pronounced Shmone. And every time, since the first time I learned the number eight years ago, the song came to my mind that Shmone, 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 Shmone. I, I can't get that out of my head. So I love the word eight. We don't have any sound like it in English. We don't say Shmone anything, but Shmone, okay? It comes from the uh, root word, which is Shamein. Okay, and you will see this when we get to the account of King David someday when he's lined up after his brothers. He's the eighth brother, okay, and then they pour oil on his head. These two ideas are joined together in that particular passage. And so you're going to see this again in the Bible. But shamein means to make fat or to cover with fat. Now that sounds gross to us, but the Hebrew mind, it gives the impression of superabundance. Okay, now when shamein is used as a participle, it means one who abounds in strength. And when it is used as a noun, it means super abundant fertility or oil, okay? So that number as a numeral means the super abundant number, okay? 50, if you know your Bible in the Old Testament at all, they have what's called the year of Jubilee every 50th year. It is the number of Jubilee or of deliverance. It points to deliverance and rest following the result of a perfect consummation of time. And so what you have in 400 is the product of eight and 50. It is a divinely perfect period resulting in rest. It is the time frame that was used specifically 400 years by God to indicate the time of bondage of the people from Abraham until the time of the Exodus. If you remember that from Genesis chapter 15, the 13th verse, I think. It's also repeated in Acts chapter seven. All right, all of this might seem like overanalyzing a bunch of Edomites that are riding on camels across the desert, but I assure you, it is not. The number 400 here is pointing to the entire time of Israel's history as a people. From their inception all the way until the kingdom age, the millennial reign, which is future to us now, that divinely appointed period resulting in rest, the rest of the thousand years millennial reign of Christ. As noted, it is this divinely perfect period which results in rest. This is how numbers work in the Bible. You take lesser numbers in a consistent manner. You don't just make things up out of your head and you come to a greater result based on those. And this is the reason for the inclusion of God's, uh, God including this number 400 specifically right here. Jacob is interacting with G Esau just as Jesus interacts with humanity through Israel in order to bring about this perfectly divine period which will result in rest. In the next verse, we're going to see one way that God accomplished this, verse seven. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. Jacob has no idea what Esau's intentions truly are, okay? And with the coming of the 400 people, he becomes afraid and he becomes distressed. If there were nothing to fear, he would not have done this. But remember, it was Jacob who left 20 years ago after deceiving Isaac and being threatened by Esau, okay? Adam Clark describes Jacob's feelings this way. He says, he that has a good conscience has a brazen wall for his defense. For a guilty conscience, I think of Bill Clinton when I read this, a guilty conscience needs no accuser. Sooner or later, it will tell the truth. You have to start saying, what does is mean when you come to that point in your guilty conscience. Whereas if you have a clear conscience, you have a brazen wall. Nothing will affect you because your conscience is good. All right, he goes on to say sooner or later, it's gonna tell the truth and not only make men turn pale who has it, but also cause him to tremble even while his guilt is known only to himself and God. 
Jacob knew. Maybe he never told his wives, but he knew. And now his conscience is coming back to bite him. His conscience tells the truth of his past actions. And now they lay open to the future in his meeting with Esau. And his fear and distress are actually showing a lack of trust at the very promises which God had given him back before he left the land and all of the visions that he had during his time there. And then he comes down here and he sees God's camp and he knows he's protected and he forgets all of that because of this guilty conscience. His worry is the weakness of his soul and he struggles with what lies ahead of him. The Geneva Bible says about this verse, though he was comforted by angels, yet the infirmity of the flesh appears. And isn't that all of us? We're comforted by angels. We know that God's word says so. We're comforted by his word. We have all of the sure promises of the Bible. And yet when we have a guilty conscience, maybe we've been sleeping around behind our husband or our wife, or maybe we've been dishonest in our dealings with others. And that guilty conscience comes through. Isn't that the way it is? You gotta think about these things. We need to have a brazen wall of a defense in our life. And that only comes through sincerity and open dealings. And once we start lying to other people, it only magnifies itself in our own lives. All right, so in order to protect at least a portion of the people, Jacob divides the camp into two camps. If one camp is attacked, maybe the other one is gonna be safe. And this division of Jacob into two camps is realized, yes, in the division of the nation of Israel into the northern and southern kingdoms. That's the picture that we're to get from this short set of verses today. This was an action which was directed by God. He, if you remember the story, you have the great King David, you have his son Solomon, Solomon messes up and God says, I'm gonna take away a portion of the tribes from the people of Israel. And so what does he do? He sends the prophet Ahia to go to Jeroboam and he takes off his garment, he tears it into 12 pieces and he gives 12 pieces to Jeroboam. And he says, I'm giving you 10 tribes of the nation of Israel and two are gonna remain down for Judah. And God did this in order to protect his people as they lead to the Messiah. There is no doubt about it. He knows what is right and what is correct to preserve his people. However, in the chapters ahead, Jacob's two camps are going to be reunited into one camp. And the same promise was given to Israel. The Bible foretold that there would be a point in history when there would no longer be a division between the two kingdoms as they lived in the land of Israel. And guess what? That is right now in human history. It happened the year that my wife was born. And we're seeing it fulfilled daily in the newspapers if we simply read them. This is what God is doing. There is one united Israel coming to the end of its divinely perfect period. Verse eight, our last verse of the day. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. In the camp's division comes the wisdom of many battlefields. While the enemy is engaged with a portion of the force, the others can rally to them, they can flank them, or they can escape. Jacob is so unsure of the outcome that he takes this course of action. And perfect thing, my wife and I were watching a 24 part series on the battle in the, the Pacific over World War II. And after that, it led right into the Korean conflict. And uh, we saw that Korea was a divided nation at the end of the war at the 38th parallel. And the North Koreans came in and they started attacking. And so we sent a small force in to stem that from happening. And eventually the North Koreans came all the way down to what was called the Pusan perimeter. One teeny little portion of South Korea was left. MacArthur had his forces and they were trying to get people in desperately quickly to stave off this invasion. And he came up with a plan that was so chancy, it was one of the chanciest things done in American military history. He said, I'm gonna send a force around the peninsula and I'm gonna come this way at these people. And if it failed, we would have lost that war. It would have been a catastrophe for the people left in the Pusan perimeter and it prevailed. And that shows you the greatness of a military man that is willing to take chances. MacArthur, despite his many failure, failings, was a great military leader. But this battle technique is used several times in the Bible as well. You'll see this again and again, where they divide forces and they do certain things, flanking mover, maneuvers or two battles at one time facing each other. And I'm gonna read you one account from when King David had such a battle in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 10. It says that when Joab, who's the commander of David's army, saw that the battle line was against him before and behind, he chose some of Israel's best and put them in battle array against the Syrians. And he, the rest of the people he put under the command of Abishai, his brother, that he might set them in battle array against the people of Ammon. Then he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, 
then you shall help me. But if the people of Amman are too strong for you, then I will come and help you. Be of good courage. Let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And may the Lord do what is right and good in his sight. In Jacob dividing his camp, he may actually consider that this is a part of God's promises to keep him alive. All he can do is trust that God is in control of the situation and that his actions are the correct course of action to take. Jacob's dividing of the camp was to avoid the possibility of annihilation. God's division of Israel served exactly that same purpose. When the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed and carried away captive, the southern kingdom of Judah remained. And a remnant of all of the tribes of Israel, God even assured this before that exile, a remnant of all of the tribes of Israel had moved down into the southern tribes of Judah because they saw the apostasy and the false worship. And so people from every tribe went down to Judah. And so the people of Israel have been protected ever since then, despite two exiles. And I can assure you, because of this, if you go after the exile of the 10 tribes, you will read names of almost every tribe of Israel recorded after that exile. And then in the book of Acts in the New Testament, Paul speaks of the 12 tribes that are right there with him. And also Peter and James are writing to the 12 tribes. Therefore, there are no lost tribes of Israel. And I say that because that's one of the most important things for you to remember to stay out of a cult. Because people all around the world say we are the lost 10 tribes of Israel. British Israelium does it. Israelianism. You get the Mormons who say that we're the people, the Hebrew people that migrated over and blah, blah, blah. And you get these people of the Church of God, one sect of it up in the Northeast, or I'm sorry, the Northern areas, and they say, we are the lost tribes of Israel. And these people are in cults and they're brainwashed into believing something that is not true. God preserved his people Israel and he did it for a specific reason. Both Testaments of the Bible confirm this. He has faithfully watched over them. And in the past eight verses, we've seen the wisdom of God reflected in Jacob's decision to divide his camp. One action picturing something else that's coming in human history as God unfolds his word before us. Now that Jacob has made his decision, he's gonna take the wisest course of action of all, and it is where we are going to turn next week for our four verses of instruction, which can guide you all the days of your life, your very troubled lives called Jacob's Prayer. Now, before we uh, get to our closing verse, please give me just a couple minutes to explain the cross of Jesus Christ and its importance to you. All of these stories, all of these pictures in God's word are leading to one ultimate goal, and that is the revealing of Jesus Christ and his work on your behalf. So let me explain this to you. The Bible says that we are fallen people. That's pictured by what we saw today, Esau, Edom, Seir. We're fallen people that have a conscience about our fall. It was inherited through our father, Adam. We've inherited sin. And Jesus said, even before uh, we were born, the Bible says that before we were born, we, we were conceived in sin. He says that we don't need to do anything to be condemned. We're condemned already, John 3, 18. But God devised a plan to reconcile us to himself. And as I explained earlier, Jesus Christ came into the womb of a woman. He did not inherit Adam's sin. And then he lived the life perfectly, fulfilling the law on our behalf that we could not fulfill. There's no way we can meet the demands of the law, but he did. And then he stretched his arms out on a cross. He shed his blood and says, I will be your substitute instead of God pouring out his wrath upon you. He's doing it on me. If you will simply receive what I am doing for you, I will give you my righteousness and I will take your sin. And then you talk about the Teflon president, you know, people call it Bill Clinton, they call it Ronald Reagan. You talk about Teflon, Jesus Christ went to the grave for our sins, but because he did not sin, the sin could not stick to him. And he resurrected from the grave. He triumphed over the power of the devil. And now he offers that to us simply by saying, I want what Jesus did. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time of God's favor. Do not leave here today without asking Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to be reconciled to God the Father. That's what he wants, and that's what every one of these stories is leading to. Slowly but surely, God is saying he is coming, and he did come, and he's here. And if you call on him, he'll seal you with the Holy Spirit, and his ministering angels will be there for you all the days of your life. Our closing verse comes from Ezekiel chapter 37. As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and write on it for Judah and the children of Israel, his companions. 
Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim for all the house of Israel and his companions. Then join them one to another for yourself into one stick and they will become one in your hand. Great things God did for Israel in 1948, 1967, 1973, even to this day, he's watching over them. Great things he's done. I'll tell you this, next week is uh, Genesis 32 verses nine through 12, Jacob's prayer. And before I give you our poem and we take communion, I want you to know that the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. And he has a good plan and a purpose for you. So call on him and let him do marvelous things for you and through you. Real short poem today and then uh, we'll take communion. This is called Two Camps. So Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him as he went along. When Jacob saw them, he did say, this is God's camp. Look at the angelic throng. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim because there were two camps, as it would seem. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother in Seir, the country of Edom, a land somewhat grim. His older brother had left Canaan and moved to there. And he commanded them saying, speak thus to my Lord Esau, these words I allow. Thus your servant says, as he was praying, I have dwelt with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen, donkeys and flocks too, and male and female servants as well. And I have sent them to tell my Lord, yes to you, that I may find favor in your sight and my worries dispel. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau, all right, and he is coming to meet you where you are staying. And 400 men are with him, so sit tight. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels at his behest into two companies because things looked quite grim. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape destruction and flee to safety. And of all that I have, I won't be bereft. Just as Jacob separated his company in two, God divided Israel in a similar way. And though the northern tribes were exiled in BC 722, some of all 12 tribes have endured to this day. They are a people set apart by him for his glory, both to usher in the Messiah and to receive him again someday. This is the marvel of Israel as told in God's story. And so for this group of people, let us remember to pray. But we in the church are God's people too, united to him in a glorious way. We are sealed with his spirit and born anew, promised eternal life because Jesus, our debt did pay. What a glorious God you are to look upon us so. What a wonderful plan you have revealed to us. In your awesome presence, we shall walk forever, we know, all because of the giving of your Son, our Lord Jesus. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for these beautiful pictures which continuously come up again and again that you love us enough to do what you did in the person of Jesus. Fallen man separated from you and man can be restored to you through him. And we do pray for the people of Israel. I pray that their eyes will be open to the truth of who you are. I pray that it will be soon, that they will call on you as Lord and be reconciled to you in that glorious way that your word pictures. And until that day, I pr pray that you continue to protect them and protect each person here as well. Take care of them in the week ahead. Keep them from any disaster or harm. Just bless them in their hearts and bless them in their souls. Bless them at their table and everybody that comes in and out of their doors. May they be blessed as well. I thank you, Lord, for all the goodness that you've displayed in your son, Jesus, to us. And so it's in his name we pray. Amen.